Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, New Frontiers in the Science and Treatment of Autism. I'm Charlie Zena. I am Vice Chair of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry here at Tulane, and I am really excited about this dream team of expertise we have on the panel today for you. I'll be introducing them in just a minute. Um, but before I do, um, I'll say that this uh, webinar has been a long time coming. We've been working on trying to figure out uh, when we could do this for some time, and we're very excited to finally be uh, bringing it to you. We are very interested in your questions and comments. Um, and you can enter those in the chat throughout the session. So we really encourage you to do that. We will have time at the end uh, to have uh, to address uh, many of the questions and comments. So we encourage you to do that. So uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists to you. First is Dr. John Constantino, who is the Blanche F. Idelson Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Constantino's work is focused on understanding genetic and environmental influences on disorders of social development in childhood and the implications of those influences for optimizing outcomes in children. Dr. Daniel Geshwind is the Gordon and Virginia McDonald Distinguished Professor of Human Genetics, Neurology, and Psychiatry at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. The overarching goal of Dr. Geshwin's work is to develop a more detailed mechanistic understanding of neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative diseases by integrative analyses that connect human genetic variations to genes and neurobiological pathways. Dr. Ami Klin is director of the Marcus Autism Center at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and the Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Klin's primary research activities have focused on the emergence of social mind and brain and disruptions thereof in autism, uh, studied from infancy through adulthood. His efforts aim at lowering the age of detection and improving access to early treatment with the goal of improving outcomes for children with autism. Dr. Lisa Settles is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at Tulane University and is the Clinical Director of the Tulane Center for Autism and Related Disorders, or as we know it, TCART. The main focus of her clinical work is on the assessment and diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders across the lifespan and the interdisciplinary collaboration that that work entails. Laura Slatkin, launched Nest Fragrances in New York in 2008 with an inaugural collection of luxury scented candles. Outside the world of fragrance, Laura is committed to various causes, most notably autism. In 2003, along with her husband, Harry, and some of their closest colleagues, she co-founded Next for Autism, an organization that transforms the national landscape of services for people with autism by strategically designing, launching, and supporting innovative programs. So we will have an opportunity to talk individually uh, with each of these panelists and uh, also uh, have some discussion with them as the webinar continues. So I'm gonna get us started by uh, asking John Constantino uh, the first question, which is, since nearly all children with autism are born to typically developing parents, what does it mean to say autism is genetic? Well, uh, Charlie, the, the, the beginning of that story is the observations from studies of millions of people around the world, literally millions, and looking at the way autism travels, as it were, in families. And we learned from those studies, this is going back decades, that, um, that a basic principle is that when two members of a family are genetically identical to one another, as is the case for identical twins, it's almost always the case that when one has it, has autism, the other one has autism. And 
their conditions are very similar to one another. The, 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 the parallel observation is that when you have a pair of twins that are non-identical and non-identical twins share only half of their genome, their genetic variation, but they have the same intrauterine environment. They, when they're reared together, and these studies are all done with twins reared together, they have the same exposures, the same, many of the same early life experiences. They breathe the same air and air pollution. They're exposed to the same fertilizers and toxins. And yet in that situation, with all of that sharing, when you cut the genetic similarity in half, the trait concordance for autism plummets from close to 100% to around 20%. And that's some of the strongest evidence that we have that autism travels in families and is inherited. Now, how could it be then that so many children with autism are born to typically developing parents? And the answer to that is that it works like many, that much of the autism that is inherited and, and and, and so much of autism is inherited in the population. And it works like a number of our complex diseases like diabetes, hypertension, uh, other psychiatric conditions. And, and, and Charlie, I should say, you, you, know, you introduced this whole wonderful panel of people, but uh, I have to say it's such a pleasure not only to be with all of them, but, but also with you. You've been a leader in our field of child psychiatry uh, since the time of my own training. and. and uh, um, but, but are these conditions, these behavioral conditions of, of all humanity are often complex. And so what happens is, is that the contributors to those conditions can be floating around in the maternal lineage and the paternal lineage. And it's the, just having particular combinations of genetic factors that one inherits from a mother and a father or a particular level of aggregation of traits that one inherits that, um, that produce the syndrome. And if the syndrome, it can be very, very mild. It can be actually advantageous in some situations, the, the, some of the characterizing traits and features of autism. But sometimes when it's very intense or when there's a high loading of that, then that child will be affected in a way that, uh, that they'll have an autistic syndrome. The other, the other pathway to this that is very exciting for science is that sometimes autism can arise on a genetic basis that has nothing to do with the parents. And so what happens is, is that genetic variations that can arise in, at random in the germline, so those are in the, in the sperm cells or the egg cells of, that formed a baby, but were not part of the parent's genome. If those variations actually affect a brain gene, then the baby has a, condition or a variant that neither of his parents have. And this has been not one way that we have found uh, uh, non-familial cases of autism that are of great interest to the scientific community for how can a single gene variant re re result in the syndrome? So John, let me ask you this. Sometimes we encounter families who have more than one child affected by autism, and sometimes it's a single child. So how do we understand that? Yeah, well, oftentimes the, the single cases uh, are inherited just like the recurrent cases in family and in families, and you just haven't had enough children to have another, you know, in ch child affected. And the, the recurrence rate for autism is about 20%. So in a family where one individual has been affected, uh, full siblings will be affected about 20% of the time. And, and so that's kind of the statistics of, who else in the family will be affected? Sometimes when there is a single member of a family that's been affected by autism, it's because of a germline mutation that, that is a, the result of a, of a single new genetic variant to that family. And oftentimes those are associated with more severe forms of autism. The, the other way that it, that, the, the, um, the, the condition will turn up in the family, again, is this recurrence of inherited uh, uh, variation. And those tend to be the full broad range of autism that occurs in the community. And in science, one of the things that we've been very excited about 
um, and rightly so, are the sort of single gene causes because those would give us a biologically tractable window to study autism. But the problem is, is that most of those kinds of autism that are caused by a single germline mutation are often severe and, and accompanied by intellectual disability, which is not um, the typical for all people with autism. Uh, intellectual disability, formerly mental retardation, only affects about 20% of all people affected by autism. And so these single gene causes are different than the inherited types of autism that occur. And the problem with the inherited types is that we don't have a single target to go, to go after in science unless we understand how those various complicated and inherited factors converge on the development of brain and behavior. And so many of us are very focused, as you have, Charlie, been in your career, and Ami has been in his career, at understanding very early developmental liabilities that are inherited that we can now target or begin to target with intervention. Thank you, John. Dan, I'm going to turn to you next and have you continue this discussion and tell us a bit about what we know about the genetics of autism. It's certainly been a major focus of research for a number of years now. Um, so what, where are we? What do we know and where are we headed? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Charlie. And thanks, John, for introducing the topic, because I think John really uh, set a nice foundation. It's really I want to thank everybody for uh, for being here today and for uh, Tulane for putting this together, inviting us, you Charlie for emceeing and asking these great questions. Um, many of you may not know, but I have a junior at Tulane and um, have gotten very attached to the school, all of us, the whole family. Uh, we love it. And I went to another green school and I like Tulane. Tulane's more fun than Dartmouth was. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Um, all of that aside, now on to more serious things. Um, um, you know, as John, you know, the, the issue is that autism, like other common disorders, has substantial genetic liability, but genetics isn't um, deterministic necessarily in many cases. There's room for environmental and gene environment interaction, but genetics does give us a starting point for understanding disease mechanisms. It's a, it, it's a much smaller sandbox to play in than the entire env environment and trying to figure out how that's impacting the brain. It gives us a causal anchor that anchors are beginning to think about the disorder. And let me just diverge for a second in talking about what that causal anchor really means and how important it is. I'm gonna talk about the tummy. And um, the tummy is something that's very interesting to most of us. Um, we get hungry, we like to eat, and some of us get ulcers. And when I was in medical school, ulcers were uh, I was taught they were due to stress and spicy foods, not just stress, but the inability of the person to actually psychologically handle the stress. And when I went, I did some reading and I found out that in the 60s, around the same time that Bettelheim wrote his book called The Empty Fortress, which blamed, you know, certain characteristics in mothers for their artistic child, the same thing was being done in ulcers. It was kind of uh, domineering mothers causing uh, children with ulcers. Well, this kind of percolated through the entire, you know, my medical education, you know, when we're being taught that ulcers, you know, and so what do we do? We give antacids and tell people to avoid stress and spicy foods. And that has some mitigating effect, but the ulcers come back. And the reason they come back was shown by two Australian physicians in the early 90s, and it took about 15 years for this to be really accepted to the point where they got the Nobel Prize in the mid, I think in 2005 or 2003 or something for, you know, for this, but they found a bacteria. They found that it was an inflammatory condition. And if you treat the bacteria, which they named H. pylori for the, um, yeah, anyway, a part of the, part of the gut, um, that ulcers would essentially be cured and go away, you know, along with the other um, anti, other treatments as well. So. The causal anchor was essential in changing therapy for the disease, in changing the whole notion of what the etiology of the disorder was and led to rational therapy. The same thing is happening in cancer now where genetic sequencing in about 6% of cases identifies uh, patients who are, get specific kinds of therapies. So the genetics provides a mechanistic basis for understanding. And when I started work in autism about 20 years ago, it was kind of at the level almost 
of ulcers that I was just uh, describing to you. It was a little better than that, but you know, because there was a thought that at least there was a genetic basis, but we didn't know what it was. But we're on the cusp of a revolution in our understanding. I'll try to make this brief, but you asked a very big question. So we've now identified more than 100 different genes that cause autism and, and related disorders. And uh, genetics gives a starting point. I'll make three ma major points about that. One is that it shows us that for these rare large effect mutations, these things like Down syndrome that the parents don't have that are called de novo, but occur in the germline, those occur in 10 to 20% of cases. And um, they usually cause a more severe form. And that gene is sufficient to cause the disorder. Without that major gene, the child would likely have a much more typical developmental course. These are all rare. None of them account for more than 1% of cases. So even among those 20%, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, less than 0.2%. And so from that perspective, that group of autism is a, is a collection of rare diseases. And, 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 um, and those that don't harbor a, a large effect mutation have the kind of inheritance that John was talking about, where it's a combination of rare and common factors that come together additively to cause this. And that's why the parents often are unaffected um, uh, because, because um, it, it's a kind of, it takes a certain additive amount to push you over a threshold. So although these genes increase risk for autism, there's no such thing as an autism gene, right? Because these, the common genetic effects are very, very small, each of them. And so it takes a lot of variation in a lot of different genes, none of which are autism genes. And even these rare effects, these are just genes involved in brain development. And the mutation causes a problem with brain development or knocks it off the track, so to speak, that it's normally on. And the organism, you know, we can't, it, it, it's too big of an insult for us to fully compensate for, and it gives, changes development, increasing risk for autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders, but not necessarily causing, because a lot of these, as John mentioned, might have intellectual disability or epilepsy, some even schizophrenia. Um, but, but even knowing that, like even all of that being said, so we've learned heterogeneity, We've learned this thing called pleiotropy, which is that the gene can cause many different things, but it does give us a clear starting point because we can engineer these mutations and these variants into stem cells, which now we can make little mini brains and organoids in a dish. We can do the same thing in mice and look at behavior and look at circuits. And many of these, it's really surprising because many mutations that have been put into mice cause defects in social behavior. Now, some of that may be overdone a little bit, but the point is that we really think that we can study these mutations in model systems, identify the mechanisms, and then this has led or will lead to specific clinical trials. Um, and, and, um, and, and so just to end on that, there's really a lot of hope for development of therapies based on these findings, even if they're not that specific. But they've also shown us when and where autism begins so they can inform other questions. So if we ask, where do these genes act? Where do most of them coalesce? Do they converge on a specific set of cells or in a developmental process? Are they expressed postnatally around the time children get vaccines? The answer is no. They're expressed during in utero development, highest during early first and second trimesters. Um, some of them continue to be expressed and go up a little bit. So that's not the full story. Not every gene is express like that, but if you want to ask where most of the signal is, it's in very early brain development and, um, um, and, and that that leads to changes in development that change the circuitry of the brain. The last point I want to make, and then I'll shut up for good and let you ask your next question, but I really think it's important to make. So these changes that occur change a little bit about the way the brain works, and this can lead to strengths and weaknesses, right? And the weaknesses are what we call autism, but often there's, it, it's just, let's call it a difference. The brain is working differently. And if it's very, very severe, we have a severe problem and we need to, you know, uh, you know, to, to mediate that, to modulate that. If it's not so severe, then we don't need to, to, you know, to do as much. And, and, and just, you know, we really have to think about this as a, as a kind of difference in the way the brain development, you know, develops and, and, and accept it, uh, um, that there are a lot of differences. We're all different, but, but yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. I'll, yeah. So Dan, before you stop, 
I'm just curious, um, as you look ahead, where will we be in 25 years? In 25 years, we will be, first of all, maybe within a decade, every child who is born will have whole genome sequence done, and this will be part of their medical record. Whether this is done by health systems or by companies that, you know, that do this, it's, or the insurance companies, it's gonna be done. Um, and the reason for that is because it can help prevent and predict a lot of things. And, 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 and the cost savings will be extraordinarily clear. Of course, the, the, um, you know, that's what the health system cares about. What we care about is uh, you know, how we're, our quality of life. And so, um, you know, so we'll have that. And so in the case of autism, we'll be able to identify children really early around birth that have high risk, you know, that are in certain high risk groups of having abnormal development that may have difficulties with social cognition and we'll be able to funnel them into treatment. And my hope is we'll know enough, maybe not in 10 years, but in 20, 25 years, where we can actually say, okay, for this, this mutation, this set of genetic factors, coupled with other things that, the, you know, these other biomarkers, let's say, will, you know, tell us that, um, you know, this child needs a particular social intervention or a particular social intervention, language intervention, plus this specific medicine that targets the pathways that are disrupted in them. So the idea is the implementation of what we call precision medicine, um, which is going on in cancer now, but which we have a lot more to learn about to, to implement. And somewhere in the next 10 to 25 years, I think we're gonna be there for developmental disorders, um, you know, including autism. And, um, and but, but another point is, it, this isn't gonna be deterministic, right? Because the point is, we'll be able to identify these kids and hopefully we'll be able to, you know, to change their trajectory to optimize outcome for them. And, and, um, and then there'll be some kids who, who, um, who fall in between. Like it, it's not gonna be for everybody. Like we're not gonna identify every single kid, but it's gonna really impact our ability to identify a lot of kids much earlier and have a much more specific notion of what we should do for them and what their outcome is gonna be so that we can talk with their parents early on about what we're, what we're expecting. Um, but again, what's gonna happen is because we're gonna intervene we'll probably optimize those outcomes even further. In other words, uh, I, I'm optimistic that outcomes will get better and better over time. Thank you, that's, that's great. So Ami, um, I remember maybe 30 years or so ago, there were a number of papers out in which there was this enormous discrepancy between when, child, when parents became concerned about their child and when that child eventually got identified as having autism, sometimes years would go by. And I think that created a lot of interest in early identification uh, and, and ultimately early intervention. And I know you've been very active in this area. So tell us about that. Thank you, Charlie. And, uh, and thank you very much for organizing it all. Uh, wonderful to see the panelists and most of all, Thank you to everybody who is tuning in. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the CDC data has shown us uh, that uh, from the time that a parent is first concerned about their child and the time that uh, that parent uh, gets access to diagnostic evaluation and eventually to services is about three and a half years, which is which in developmental terms, and you taught us all about development, Charlie, uh, is huge. So to answer the question of why this is important, I think it's important to think of autism as, as both a public health uh, challenge as well as a public health opportunity. So uh, John's and Dan's answers provide the right platform to answer your question. Imagine that autism is the most common form of a complex neurodevelopmental condition, 2% of the population. Uh, in other terms, there are 73, 75,000 children who are gonna be born this year who are going to have autism. So this is a very common condition. And this has changed, of course, over the years as we finally were able to get this number right. Um, imagine that the societal cost of autism is in excess of $120 billion a year uh, in the US alone. 
And, uh, and the most important number is also the enormous economic burden for individual families, which ranges from 1.5 to about $3.5 million for lifetime treatment for a child with autism. It's an enormous economic burden. Now, most of these funds go to, um, uh, to finance services for individuals who are older and more disabled. And uh, so uh, the real burdens for families are, as you heard before, intellectual disabilities, language disabilities, and severe behavior challenges. Now, some people have associated that as, uh, as uh, uh, conditions that are inevitable in autism, and uh, the science of the past uh, 10 years or so have shown that this is not so. In fact, it is consensual. The American Academy of Pediatrics mandates screening for autism at, at the ages of 18 and 24 months. And yet, the median age of diagnosis of autism in this country is stubbornly stuck at the age of four and a half and five, which basically means that more than half of the population of children with autism are only identified during their school years. And by that time, they are identified not necessarily because of their autism, but because uh, they are not adjusting to school or they are having uh, severe behavior challenges. So um, uh, to build on John's and Dan's answers, um, the period of our first years of life is the period of maximal brain plasticity in our lives. So imagine that by the time that we celebrate the first birthday of our children, um, uh, their brains have doubled and synaptic density, which is an index of the complexity of brain development has quadrupled. This is by the end of the first year of life. As as, as Dan was mentioning, uh, autism is the most strongly genetic of all complex neurodevelopmental conditions, but it's not deterministic. So what does that mean? It means that the liabilities that we are born with do not necessarily determine our lifetime outcomes. In fact, what the genetic liability does following what Dan mentioned is that it disrupts typical development, normative development, things that every baby does. We all need to learn to speak, we need to acquire language, we need to communicate with others, we need to relate with others, and we need to learn how to, how to read people's minds. Uh, we need to understand their intentions, their emotions, and uh, their beliefs and so forth so that we can navigate the demands of everyday life. So what happens is that disruption happens from birth and uh, children with autism are born with this attenuated sense of the other. And yet the platform for brain development is the reciprocally, uh, is the mutually reinforcing choreography between baby and caregiver. And if that choreography is disrupted, what follows, what results from that is autism. So in a way, our brains don't determine who we're going to be as much as the brains become who we are. And therefore their early experiences are really, really critical. And what the science of the past 10 years have shown is that were we to be able to detect, identify, and diagnose children very early and provide access to early treatment, uh, the thousands and thousands of missed opportunities of social learning that our children, that children with autism uh, miss um, could be ameliorated. So in a way, we can significantly attenuate the emergence of, sy of symptoms, and we can optimize these children's outcomes to the point we can have the majority of children reaching the age of three years um, still with the autism trait, but without those major burdens associated with intellectual disability. So that's really, uh, it's a very different view of autism than we had for many, many years. Um, uh, really, very optimistic news on the genetic front and on the experience front in terms of thinking about how to move towards more optimal outcomes for these children. So, John, let me turn back to you and ask you, what are the prospects for new treatments um, for children with autism before it develops, after it develops? I think you're muted, John. Sure. So Based on a lot of the work that's been done, Charlie, to trace the early origins of autism, particularly in families where a baby is born uh, in a family that already has a sibling affected by autism, 
And as these families are, are tracked prospectively, we've learned a great deal about identifying some of the um, developmental influences on autism that occur before autism develops. And one of, the, one of the remarkable things is that, you know, a lot of our efforts to treat autism or to treat autism early or to, you know, uh, um, you know, begin the treatment of autism after it's first diagnosed. But I think Ami would share the view with me that some of our best prospects for treatment are going to be to try to alter the course of development before autism develops. And we have lots of reasons to believe that, that um, if we get out in front of it in the first year of life, uh, identifying, as Dan said, some of those factors, whether they're biological or developmental, that we can target, that we may have much more effective uh, uh, types of intervention to optimize outcomes, to promote the development of babies, and to even head off the uh, either the severity or even the occurrence of the condition. So one great frontier is essentially pre-diagnostic developmental therapies, which really are not, you know, universally available yet, but are part of the scientific mission. Dan mentioned the biological options or prospects for therapies that may target very rare conditions that, you know, resolve to a you know, a highly, identifiable bi a highly identifiable biology based on a single gene variant or the deletion of a gene or its function that we could somehow replace. And so the gene-based therapies are, you know, um, they're happening now for other medical conditions and for some of the first uh, types of developmental uh, uh, disabilities and, and, and significant disorders of childhood that are actually correcting those um, genetic variants. A third, a third very important prospect for treatment was brought up by one of your viewers that uh, uh, put in a question, Leanne, asked a question about the comorbidities. And uh, that means that when a child with autism also has another condition, whether it's an anxiety disorder or ADHD or uh, a mood disorder or other kinds of developmental uh, hurdles that are treatable, it's so important to treat those. And, and, you know, historically, we were even reluctant to diagnose them because in the old days, we thought, well, you have to have one condition or the other. You can't have both. But now we know that they contribute to each other. They amplify each other. And that it's, it makes total sense to try to identify and treat comorbid conditions that you can actually treat. And then the final thing that the three of us are engaged in and, and, and very invested in right now is that based on some of our prior work, and this is a, a long story that I'll make short, but, uh, but a sad story, is that um, in the US, if you have an autism spectrum disorder population-wide, the likelihood that that condition is going to be complicated by one of the most severe comorbidities of all, which is intellectual disability, is about 20 to 25% of all cases of autism. The problem is that if you are a child in this country uh, who is black or Hispanic, a minority uh, child born with uh, autism, your chances of having an intellectual disability uh, are upwards of 35 all the way up to 55%, okay? In comparison to the population uh, average of 20 to 25%. Now, why is this, why is this the case? Historically, we, um, I think, accepted a sort of an excuse that because minority children are diagnosed less commonly because of other kind of health disparities, that only the more severe cases get diagnosed. But in the work that Dan and Ami and I uh, have been in, engaged in and, and work that has been centered also uh, with the uh, Centers for Disease Control, it turns out that in the last several uh, years that the diagnosis for autism has caught up in the minority community. Like as many African-American and Hispanic kids are getting diagnosed with autism in the community as white children. And it's, it tends to be a little bit later, but not that much later of a diagnosis. But their services that they get as a function of being diagnosed are way different than what the average child in the US gets. 
And now that we know that those community rates are equal, we know that that's no excuse for the fact that twice as many children who are minority children are having this comorbidity. Now, now think about what that means. Intellectual disability is lifelong. This is formerly what was called mental retardation. To think about that as a disproportionality uh, affecting double the number of children affected by autism, and autism is not a rare condition. You can make the case that there are about a quarter of a million excess cases of intellectual disability in the US caused by race-based health disparities in access to the treatments that we know help all children with autism, the developmental therapies, which these children just aren't getting. And so the, 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 the last frontier that I wanna mention is actually giving all children what we know actually helps in autism. And what actually helps in autism doesn't cure autism, but the right kinds of developmental therapy, reasonable, not you know, excessive, not over, just, just the, you know, what has been established as a reasonable level of de developmental therapy and care would, would we believe needs to be demonstrated would offset these, these disproportionate risks. And I think it's a very important frontier for our country to get to the business of making sure that children get what we already know, is, know works. And how does it work? It improves adaptive fun functioning, it improves language, it improves play-based skills, include, improves adaptation, and it offsets the risk for these severe intellectual impairments when autism is already enough for a child to be dealing with. So those are the, those are the ways that I think really are the front burner for the, the frontier for therapy. Thank you, John, for bringing up such an important topic. I know that, Ami, you've also been concerned about racial and socioeconomic disparities with regard to access to services and outcomes. Do you have additional thoughts? Ami, you're still muted. There you go. That's the most common uh, sort of phrase in those webinars. You're muted. Um, so, um, so I think I want to I want to underscore what uh, what John just mentioned. Uh, so he stated a stark fact, which is the fact that uh, children of autism who are African American have double the intellectual disability burden than white children with autism, and uh, we know that uh, this is very likely due to access to services. Early experiences matter a great deal. And those early experiences, they matter not only in autism, but they matter for brain development. Uh, our country has a long history of racial and socioeconomic disparities. And uh, probably the starkest of all uh, examples is the healthcare system and within it, uh, autism. But the fact is that we have greater morbidities in prenatal care. We have greater mor morbidities in child mortality. We have greater morbidities in conditions associated with adverse childhood experiences. When we talk about um, early interventions for children with autism, the evidence base body of data that we currently have is that uh, those uh, modalities of treatment are community viable meaning that, um, that those treatments, they are carried via caregivers. They are caregiver-mediated interventions in which professionals train parents to, in a way, engineer that social engagement with the child. And those kinds of treatments are important not only for children with autism, but for children who come from poor backgrounds or from backgrounds uh, that are characterized by, that characterized by environmental challenges, by which I mean really societal challenges. In order for a child to, uh, to acquire speech and language and to communicate effectively with others, children need to live um, in a language rich environment. They need to be, um, they need to be stimulated and they need to, um, to be uh, in an environment in which they are not exposed to the kinds of stresses that so many communities are exposed to every day, and racism is one of those. Uh, therefore, uh, it is probably uh, the greatest imperative of our times that we address what John just mentioned, the fact that those 
disparities in, um, uh, in healthcare access and in healthcare outcomes is done not only at a systemic level, which is entrenched, but each one of us, including our viewers today, that takes this as a personal mission to build a community that is more social, socially just. And the idea here is that um, were we to be able uh, to disseminate community viable solutions for early detection and diagnosis and treatment, something as John mentioned, is not only currently available, but it is being done, except that is not done at the scale that is necessary, we would be able to ensure optimized outcomes for the vast majority of children who are born with those genetic risks. And that means that it is within our reach to ensure that most children born with a genetic, a medical, or an environmental risk, they can fulfill their promise. And in that way, it goes back to something that Dan mentioned. Autism is not a disease. It's not something like a a, uh, some kind of an infection that you would give an antibiotic to cure. It's a trait. It's a way of being in this world. What we all want to do is to ensure that children who are born with that trait have the opportunity to grow up and make their unique contribution to society. And for us to achieve that, we need early detection and intervention to optimize outcomes, and we need a more inclusive society. Thank you so much. That's very well said. And I especially want to underscore, I guess, the point you made that many of the points that you're making extend well beyond the condition that we call autism. Mm -hmm. um, whatever uh, early developmental trajectory that children are on, uh, which is uh, pointing towards a less than desirable outcome, we need to figure out what are the environmental adaptations that need to be made to put that ch child on a healthier developmental trajectory and uh, work on outcomes. So I think it's, it's, it's to say that this goes beyond autism alone. Indeed. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, so next I would like to turn to Lisa and have you tell us a bit about the Tulane Center for Autism and Related Disorders, or TCARD as we fondly refer to it. <laughs> thanks, Charlie, and thanks for everyone who's here today. Um, so stepping back a little bit, when I came to Tulane as a psychology intern back in 2002, there wasn't any program specifically focused on autism evaluation or treatment. Um, and I believe that became my mission from that moment on. Um, and TCARD, since opening our doors in October of 2012, we've really always had the goal of providing comprehensive diagnostic assessments, um, family navigation services, um, and eventually the hopes of having a treatment component as well. Um, to anyone who's really experiencing symptoms of a neurodevelopmental disorder. Since that time, we have uh, focused a lot on partnering with the Hayward Genetic Center in Pediatric Neurology at Tulane to really provide even a more thorough evaluation that really covers developmental, psychological, neurological, and genetic explanations of the behavior for parents. Um, once we conduct the evaluation. We have the family navigator, who's our social worker. Um, she makes herself available to families to link them with services in their home areas. Um, in addition to that, we have since become trained in the Early Start Denver model um, of intervention. And then last January, we opened an ABA treatment center that utilizes components of the CABAS model out of Columbia University. Um, our ABA Center is staffed partially by students that are in the curriculum and instruction for high incidence disabilities and in ABA uh, at graduate program at Nichols State University. So these students are actually gaining practical experience as they matriculate through their coursework required for becoming a board certified behavior analyst. Um, and we feel like that is important to offer that service to families as well. 
<clears throat> there are a number of places in New Orleans besides T-Card uh, where families can access these diagnostic assessments and services and where they can receive treatment for autism. Um, unfortunately, though, the region has really struggled trying to keep up with the demands for high quality assessments, and that's across the state and across the Gulf South. Um, one of the goals that I have always had is really in training the next generation of professionals to provide these high quality services. Um, and that has really been my focus at TCARD. Um, and I'm proud to say that I feel like we have trained several people who have gone on to open their own clinics in rural parts of the surrounding states. Um, uh, one of the other things that we have been very focused on at TCARD is uh, outreach within the community. Um, there are several ongoing efforts to really improve access to diagnosis and services. Um, there's two groups in particular that I've been involved with for several years. One is the Autism Society of Greater New Orleans. Um, I'm currently the president of that organization. Um, and then there's also another program called the Y Cubs program through the YMCA. And both have really focused on helping individuals and families who've been affected by autism and by providing resources and information, education, services, and recreational activities um, to the areas, uh, to the families that are in the area. Thank you. So, you know, I remember when I first came to New Orleans, I came from Providence, Rhode Island, and I was struck that uh, in a state whose population was about the same size as the metropolitan area in New Orleans, that there were a number of very comprehensive centers available providing services for children with autism. And in New Orleans, it was it was really, there was hardly anything. It was just a few uh, services available. And certainly there's been tremendous growth, but we have quite a long way to go to meet demand because I think uh, not only at TCARD, but at other centers in this area, there are very long waiting lists for assessments. And um, as we've heard about this evening, there's an urgency about identification and intervention that uh, we really need to be responsive to. I'm just curious, based on the discussion we had a few minutes ago about what you've noticed with regard to racial and ethnic and socioeconomic disparities. And um, do you notice that uh, some families seem to have delays and when they get referred? What are, what are, what's your experience been? Um, a T card, I would say that we have always sort of been 50-50 um, with um, African American and white families. Um, and then recently we hired a psychologist who is Spanish speaking, and that has opened up access to have a lot more of our Spanish speaking population come through. Um, and so along racial lines, it's definitely, we have been able to serve both. Um, I think one of the reasons that we have been able to serve as many as we can is that we do accept Medicaid um, and evaluations. Families are not required to pay exorbitant amounts out of pocket. Um, and so Unfortunately, when that's the case, that's when waiting lists increase as well. Um, and, you know, until we have more providers, I don't think that that's going to change, unfortunately. Thank you. So uh, making services more available is my segue to Laura. So Laura, can you tell us about Next for Autism? Thank you so much for having me uh, this evening um, because it's, it's really a topic that's very personal to me um, that I care very, very much about. Uh, we have a son with autism, David, who's just turning 22. Um, my daughter attends Tulane. Uh, she loves Tulane. We're big Tulane fans. Um, uh, we love coming to New Orleans. Uh, but yes, our son was diagnosed with autism 
um, in 2001. And similar to everyone's story, in particular Lisa, um, back in 2001, there was really nothing. You know, autism wasn't really part of the nation's vocabulary. There were very, very few services available. In fact, um, when David was diagnosed, if we wanted to if we wanted to get him into a really good school, we had to get in our car, drive over a bridge to New Jersey um, to find a state-of-the-art school for, for children with autism. So my husband and I, in response to that, started Next for Autism. We were always thinking, what's next for autism? Well, the first thing that we really wanted to tackle was the school situation. So we, we established two charter schools, one in Harlem and one in the Bronx, really thinking about that minority community. Uh, because we knew we were able to, you know, have access. But what about that single mom living in Harlem, you know, three kids, one has autism, she's working three jobs to put food on the table, what is she going to do? So the first thing we really wanted to open up those schools in under, and, and really attack this underserved population. Um, and then it's so funny, but when um, David was diagnosed with autism, um, through an early intervention center, we really wanted to learn more about the diagnosis. So we went, we had the only place to go really to get a qualified um, sort of um, diagnosis or assessment was to go up to Yale. And that's where I met Ami actually many, many years ago. Um, and that seemed a little strange to us that we would have to go all the way up to Yale when we live in New York City, one of the richest cities in the country. So um, we partnered with Columbia University, Cornell, and New York Presbyterian Hospital to build a brain center, the Center for Autism in the Developing Brain, that does precisely what TCARD is doing. Um, and that is assessment, evaluation, and treating individuals with autism across their lifespan. And again, Lisa, just like you at TCARD, we accept Medicaid. You know, we accept all forms of insurance. No one gets turned away. That was just a non-starter for us. Um, and yes, there are you know, waiting lists and, um, and it's difficult to serve, to serve the population. Um, and, and I think that you know, one of the things I learned early on is that autism is a very complex disorder and that we will make progress and we have made enormous progress advancing the, um, the basic science of autism and understanding autism. But given the numbers, um, building qualified programs is critically, critically important. And one of the, um, you know, we're always asking ourselves, um, what is needed? Where, what's the white space? And another um, need that we felt in our community was the number of qualified educators, that there simply wasn't enough qualified educators to, to treat these individuals, children with autism. So we partnered with a local college, Hunter College, to develop an autism training institute um, providing behavioral certification. And 400 teachers have passed or clinicians have, or practitioners have passed through that program. And if each if one of them touched 10 kids, we're talking about 4,000 kids, you know, having that, that, that education. And um, there are 10,000 kids in the New York City public school system. So you can see, you know, we're always thinking impact. How can we how can we build programs that really impact the community? And so we built about nine different programs and, and we're always asking ourselves again, what's next, whether it's employment um, or recreational or you know, the multitude of different programs we've developed. But now we're focused on adults with autism. There's 5.4 million adults with autism in this country. And when they turn 21, and, and I know you all know this, these, these adults just, just fall off a cliff in terms of services because once they leave the educational system um, and they go into other funding streams, there's not a lot available. So Next for Autism has been thinking, gee, what, how can we best impact the lives of an adult? And um, we you know, came to this conclusion that the direct support professionals, the people that work with the adults, are the answer because no matter where these adults are served, it's always that direct support professional that can make the life of an, an adult with autism dramatically different. So today they're mostly trained to make sure the fire extinguisher, extinguisher is in the right place or the medications have been administered and the medications get locked up that they take a shower, eat three meals a day and they're safe. But what about choice? Are they having a choice as to how they spend their day, where they go, what they eat, what they buy, what they wear each morning? Are they 
Do they have a sense of belonging in the community? Do they go out into the community and form you know, healthy um, connections to others in the community? Are they engaged in the community? Do they live a healthy life? Are they getting enough exercise? Are they doing you know, the things that will promote you know, well-being, if you will? And then there's lifelong learning. You know, we don't stop learning at 21. So are they being given the opportunity to learn new skills and advance themselves and live a fruitful, engaging, and happy and joyful life? And we, we feel through these direct support professionals, we can train them, we can monitor them, we can give them feedback, and you know that's the work that we're doing currently, um, and we're really excited about that. So, you know, autism is complicated. Someone told me early on, if you could understand autism, you would understand the brain, and the brain is such a complex organ. Um, so, you know, going back to the question that Charlie asked Dan, where will we be ten years from now? Where will we be twenty-five years from now? Autism is probably going to still be with us. So. We got to worry about these kids. We got to worry. And I was a, my family was affected by autism. I would turn to Tulane because it's such a magnificent institution. You know, I recently um, watched us go through a pandemic and see that Tulane received over $140 million worth of grants to study COVID-19 because it is the go-to place in, in New Orleans. And to partner with Tulane to build services and continue the work that Lisa's doing um, is really is really the best thing that we could possibly do is hold hands on that. Great work in this area. It's clear to me that like your scientific colleagues on the panel, you're asking great questions and you have been asking questions. I want to ask you a question, which is given all of your experience with Next for Autism and the efforts that you've made, what advice do you have for us in New Orleans and at Tulane for thinking about how to continue to build and grow and, and um, make the world a better place for individuals with autism? You know, I'm, we're really strong on public-private partnerships. And I think that's really an important, you know, when we work with Hunter College to develop that Autism Training Institute, it was easy to have impact and fast because Hunter was in that business of training educators. You know, it, we could hit the ground running working with Columbia and Cornell and New York Press to build an autism center because they were in that, we don't, don't do it yourself, but partner with other existing organizations within the community uh, because it makes it so much easier. But I think that, um, you know, we really need to get our arms around what's going to happen with adults with autism because it's, it's a big white space that's been, and there's a dearth of services, so. Well, thank you so much. So I now want to have all of us uh, address some of the questions and comments that we've received, but I'm going to take advantage of my position to ask my own question first, which is that when I was in medical school, and really for many years after that, all of the textbooks had the prevalence of autism as one in 2,500. Um, things have changed quite a bit. So what is our understanding of that change? Or, or are there things happening now that weren't happening before? Is this an identification issue? How do we explain the really remarkable changes? And not only in prevalence, but also um, it's interesting that the figure for intellectual disabilities is now 20% because it used to be just the opposite. It was 80% of individuals with autism had intellectual disabilities and only 20% didn't. So uh, how do we understand that? Uh, Charlie, I would say that you are right on the, 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 the sort of cusp of the probably the most compelling explanation. That is that the increase in the prevalence has also been accompanied by a dilution in the number and proportion of cases that are this severe form that includes intellectual disability. And so most of us believe that the increase in prevalence of autism 
and it is, is fundamentally uh, a matter of uh, a, a, a better recognition, a broadening recognition of uh, all the forms of the condition that exist in the population. You know, um, one way to think about that is you could, you could do an experiment and you could say, if we, if we were to diagnose or define autism using the current definitions that give us this current prevalence, and we were to apply that definition to a group of 20-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 60-year-olds, and 80-year-olds, okay? If the incidence of autism had changed over this era, you would see that in the older generations or in those older cohorts, using our current definitions, the prevalence would get smaller and smaller the older you get, right? Well, that experiment has been done and there's almost no change in the prevalence when you examine different age cohorts using our contemporary definitions. What's changed is our recognition and definition. And I think another way for the mathematicians maybe to think about it is we, we think that autism is not uh, an all or nothing thing. There were a couple of questions about the, uh, in the chat about the spectrum. And the spectrum extends to all humanity. And, and imagine a, almost like the bell curve, you know, for intelligence or height or weight. And all you have to do is, is move the, the line that you say, well, this on this side of the line is autism and that side of the line is not autism. All you have to do is move it a little towards the middle to get a really large increase in the prevalence. And, and some people even complain thinking, oh, you know, how can autism be so common? You know, one in 50. But if you think about one in 50, what does that really mean? That means 2.5% of the human population. And that's the same for where we place a kind of line that we want to support and help people at the far end of the distribution for many human traits. Blood pressure, stature, weight, intellectual ability. And now autism has made its way to be recognized that if you're at the two and a half percentile extreme, that at the very least we should consider what we can do to help those individuals be as supported as possible in the fold of humanity. And I think that's kind of where, that's how I would answer that question. Thank you so much. That's very illuminating. So Kelly, if I yes, may, let me. let me just be a little more crass than John was. <laughs> um, because we can tie this discussion with the discussion on disparities as well. Just like you, when I uh, first began to work in the field of autism, um, the, uh, the prevalence rate as per the very first prevalence study in, in London in 1966, he stated four per 10,000. And uh, about 85% of individuals who were identified, maybe up to 90%, certainly in England, were individuals with intellectual disability. Now, uh, now we talk about one in uh, 54, as uh, John just mentioned. So it's actually very common. Uh, so why, is, why did that happen? Because we're finally getting it right, which basically means it's an issue of ascertainment. And that issue of ascertainment, as we broaden our awareness of autism, and really the parent organizations have really uh, contributed tremendously to an increase of awareness of autism in the community so that we could reach more and more and more families. But in terms of the actual prevalence studies, those studies that are done in surveillance by the CDC have also improved over the course of the years. And so every two years, there is a new surveillance study that generates uh, prevalence rates for autism for eight-year-olds every two years. So imagine that going from one cohort to the next, from 2000 and I believe a 10 to 12, there was an increase of 125% in the number of kids who are from Spanish speaking families or Hispanic kids, about 125%. And people start asking questions about, oh, there is an epidemic 
affected this population? Well, the answer is no. The answer, the, the, uh, the answer was that we began to knock on people's doors. Mm -hmm. We began to reach different sectors of the community that were not reached before. So, um, so the answer to that is really, we're finally getting it right. As John mentioned in his first answer, we're finally getting to similar ascertainment rates across uh, racial groups. And that's actually a tremendous amount of progress. Now, given the history of disparities in our country, now we need to make similar progress in terms of providing access in ways that the solutions were not gonna work for the few. Just as Lisa was mentioned before, they will work for the many. And in order for us to do that, we need to do two things very briefly. One is being innovators um, and create solutions that are community viable. And second, in regards to disparities, those disparities also affect the number of providers that we have that look more like the children we want to reach. In, in most of medicine, uh, say for example, in cardiology, um, if I'm African-American and I'm going to see an African-American cardiologist, uh, research has shown that my outcomes improve by about 27 to 35%. And that's because my compliance improves. And that's because I actually have greater trust. So one of the problems in, in, in the state of the disparity research and healthcare is that we need to make a concerted effort to train, just like Laura was saying, not only train more providers, more individuals who can serve this population, but we need to make sure that we address the underrepresentation of minority providers and scientists in the field. And that's something that all of our academic institutions have a role in. Thank you for that. So a, a very timely question from the chat is about the effects of the pandemic on school shutdowns, uh, limiting service access. Um, what have your experiences been and what are your thoughts about the effects of the pandemic on autism? Well, Charlotte, I'll just I'll to quickly go first. It's just been it's been pretty devastating. As as we've we've said in some of our published work that, you know, individuals with developmental disabilities across the age span are some of the most severely hit victims of the pandemic among people uninfected. It's not even as much the infection, although the, the, the consequences of infection are greater for individuals with developmental disabilities of various kinds, but the consequences of mitigation procedures, missing school, not having access to in-person support um, has been really very, very difficult for this community. And I think every effort to re-engage, to uh, assuage the social isolation of being in lockdown, to get children back in school, uh, to have in-home support persons reinstated and working in close quarters safely with individuals with autism and developmental disabilities is, is so important. And I, I wanna use this opportunity to underscore something that, that Laura talked about. You know, many of us in science are very interested in the early origins of autism and trying to head it off at the past and that many of the frontiers have to do with, you know, early brain and behavioral development. But I've, as I've, I've said many times in, in my career in conversations with trainees and clinicians, that even though we think of the neurodevelopmental disorders as these sort of biological long-term you know, kind of conditions, there is nobody on earth that's more exquisitely sensitive to variation in the environment than many children with autism or many individuals with autism. And that goes through the life course in school in adolescence, in the transition to adulthood. And oftentimes the things that we take for granted as minor you know, kind of constraints of the environment can have just devastating and, and very longstanding influences in ways that, that we could change if we only knew what, what that impact really was. And so judicious planning in school, judicious support in the transition to adulthood, judicious management that People with autism are people first and autism second and not the other way around. They have depressed states. They have existential crises. They have, I, they have to form identities. And to the extent that those are compromised, 
they really bear strongly on the adaptation and the life and the behavior and the outlook for these individuals. It has been very hard for this community. Our children's hospitals right now are at triple census, much contributed by the effects of COVID in exacerbating the isolation that's inherent in having developmental disability or the, the, the intensity of how one experiences any kind of psychiatric syndrome broadly, whether it's a developmental disability condition or the psychiatric disorders. And so I think that this has been a real problem and everything that we can do to mitigate the effects of the pandemic um, is, 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 a, is a priority well tended to. And I would, and I would say that um, uh, in probably no other field we have, uh, we have felt the, uh, the shock waves of the pandemic that in the area of behavioral mental health. In a sense, uh, many, many, many individuals uh, with autism um, have, um, uh, say, challenges in the areas of anxiety and depression and lack of motivation and, um, and other issues. And not only the children and the adolescents and the adults, but uh, the providers and the educators and their families. And so I think that we're all uh, going through um, a period of, of tremendous behavioral and mental health crisis right now. And we see that in our schools, uh, in our educators, we see that in the providers who have been seen, um, their caseloads augment tremendously. So I think uh, that we're all going to be involved in this COVID recovery project um, through our schools, through our, through our children's hospitals, through our community partners because um, we now have an exacerbation of uh, uh, challenges that were quite significant before, and they are now even more so. I'm just gonna say, I agree. Really well said, both John and Ami. It's, a, it's been absolutely a disaster. Although, and it, it forced us, I mean, one thing it did force us to do is to, see what we could do given the situation, right? With remote kind of uh, assessments and remote kind of training. And of course it's not a solution or a panacea, but one of the, again, I'm always, I'm an optimist, um, you know, deep down to my core. And so if I look at this silver lining in the cloud, it's that one of the things it's shown us is that centers like ours that are located in densely populated urban areas that are very hard to get to, um, can, we can do things from people four or five hours away or in another state. So it kind of also maybe provides, you know, we need to have different models, right? Cause it's very, you know, one of the reasons, you know, there aren't enough people trained, there aren't enough centers, there isn't a big enough workforce and uh, people don't all have access. And so one way of increasing access is increasing some of the way that we actually um, you know, deliver, um, um, especially the diagnostic side of things, uh, cares, cares a much, much, much uh, tougher issue. But, but anyway, I just wanted to bring up that one, one thing that we've learned, you know, from this. I, I think we have to think of, uh, of uh, in, innovations, right, in the way that we can, we can interact to, to have a broader impact. Thank you, Dan. So one of our child psychiatry faculty members, Juliana Finelli, has a question in the chat that I'd like to pose. She, she does a lot of consulting to primary care health providers, and she notes that American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended slash required that pediatricians do screening at, uh, for children in the second year of life. But oftentimes when children screen positive, they're reluctant to make referrals for more comprehensive evaluations. Is that something any of you have encountered and what are your thoughts about it? Indeed. So uh, primary care pediatricians are the universal system of care, the gatekeepers uh, for access to healthcare. Therefore, everything goes through primary care pediatricians until the age of three. At that time, as Laura mentioned, 
school becomes the universal uh, point of care for our children until they turn 21. And as she mentioned, there is a cliff because our, our society is, is not organized to provide adequate supports for adults with developmental disabilities. But um, uh, there is a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of, of uh, successful effort going on in providing uh, uh, primary care pediatricians with the tools they need in order to serve as many families as possible um, and provide them with access to care. But there is a tremendous reluctance on their part to address this issue. And the wait and see approach is, uh, is one of the greatest obstacles that we have in early detection and intervention. When people believe that autism cannot be changed, it cannot be optimized, we cannot address this issue um, in treatment terms, and that there is no access to services. Um, there is quite a bit of, uh, of training efforts moving on. And I think to tie this up to what Dan mentioned, uh, the solutions lie in, in some innovation and some technology. There are nowadays uh, online supports for families, for primary care physicians, and for early interventionists on developmental milestones, on how to support families, mm -hmm. on how to um, uh, uh, provide families with the information they need to identify red flags, and then also how to train them on providing an environment that is going to optimize their children's outcomes. So all of you who have access to online, um, uh, online resources, autismnavigator.com, for example, provides those kinds of resources. And, um, and primary care physicians have been uh, using more and more that particular resource. Um, we need to do what Dan just said. We need to embrace the challenge and take um, the approach that makes implementation science the focus of what we do. We need to understand the system that pediatricians function in and provide solutions that are going to fit that system. In that way, we're going to support them to support the families in creating access to diagnose, to diagnosis and to treatment. Thank you. Um, so this has been a, uh, I guess I would characterize, one way I would characterize the tone of this discussion is that there has been a lot of optimism about the opportunities that we have and the, uh, um, we know that the need is great for all of us in medical schools and, and uh, involved with training uh, medical students and pediatric uh, residents and psychiatry residents, do all of you feel that we're making progress in getting the word to them about um, kind of a different new way of thinking about autism? Is that happening? Um, is there evidence? What are your thoughts about that? I think, Charlie, I think so. I mean, I remember as a trainee, you know, going back to the years when that was going on for me in the late 80s, early 90s, I remember that uh, the, the diagnosis and treatment planning was a sort of process of, uh, of pontification, that a child either has this or they have that, and the master will decide which one of those conditions those categorical conditions the child has. And now what we're learning and what we're trying to train this next generation is that all people are an amalgam of these different lines of development, cognition, emotion regulation, social competency, attention, um, all of these different threads of human development that are quantitative and that children have different you know, amalgams of the strengths and weaknesses that they should be understood in that way in order to best determine how to help them. I tell the story sometimes, there's been a lot of questions in the chat about kind of comorbidities. I often tell the story of a, of a young boy with autism who first came to me when he was five years old and he was uneducable. He could not, you know, sit still in school. He was very emotionally dysregulated. He had uh, an autism spectrum disorder, 
but he was intelligent, but he could not learn because he was so behaviorally disordered. And to make a long story short, he was treated with medicine for a while. Things kind, kind of can't calm down. He get, got better, he was learning, he was achieving, he was in middle school. And I got a call from his mother one day and she said, and we had stopped medicines a long time before that. And she said, we have to start him back on the medicine. And I said, well, why is that? He said, she said, he's, it's like he's four, four years old again. He was 13 years old at the time. It's like he's, he's four years old again. He's doing all of the dysregulated stuff that he was doing and everything's wrong. So I brought him into the, to the clinic and I said, and the residents were with me and I asked him, I said, you know, what's going on? And and his response as a 13-year-old boy with autism was, Dr. C, everybody thinks I'm a baby. That's my problem. And what had happened to this boy is that he had made a request to his mom that his mom didn't even remember. That at this age of 13, as a teenager, since his prized possession was his fish tank, he wanted to change the water. And his mom said, not on your life. You'll get, you'll get salt water all over my hardwood floors. You're not going to change the water. But to him, that was his prized possession. That was what he wanted to take care of because he loved those fish. And when his mother told him that, it was this crushing existential blow that then turned him back, you know, nine years of development on the basis of that utterance that his mother didn't even remember. And all it took was kind of undoing that and unraveling that and helping the mom to understand what this, and she was in tears when she realized what had happened. And within two weeks, it was all back. And he, and, and now he has, he's fully employed as a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning specialist in, the, in our community. But the point is, is that, you know, taking stock of all of these forces, all through development, again, as Laura was saying, not just the babies, but in school, in adolescence, in adulthood, I think that's how we have to think about human development and train our trainees to think about these conditions uh, in, in a, in a strength-based kind of way. Thank Wonderful you. story. He completed the circle by preventing water leaks from heating and air conditioning <laughs> right. from getting on the hardwood yes. floor. That's great. That's, that too. Exactly. Charlie, uh, I would add one thing to the optimism that I feel the best. Um, medical students, but psychologists and, and all, uh, all individuals involved in this field. I think that there is the emergence of this new field called early brain health. And in, in that sense, we're not talking about the 2% of autism. We're talking about 17% of children who have uh, developmental vulnerabilities. We're talking about children who have learning differences. Um, the sense that uh, that we no longer uh, need to specialize only on this very low prevalence conditions, child neurologists focusing on leukodystrophies that affect one in, uh, uh, in, 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 in 60,000 individuals sometimes, uh, some of those conditions. The notion that in early brain health, we can use innovations that are community viable and that can optimize a very large number of children. That's something that people are getting excited about. I like to say that most adults that I know were at one point children. In fact, in the, in the juvenile uh, justice system, we know that about 50 to 60% of kids who end up in that system have a language delay or disability that did not start when they start getting themselves in trouble with the law, but it started in the first years of life. Only one in five children in this country receiving special education services during their school years um, is identified before the age of three. So that's one book end that really gets people excited. That is something that if they learn that clinical science, they can have an enormous impact on a large number of vulnerable children and families. That's one book end. And the other one going back to what uh, Laura and, and, uh, and John were mentioning. We have major, major deserts of services and, um, and of expertise. And, in, uh, and most children also become adults. In fact, they become adults for really for most of their lives. And we need to make a much, much greater investment than we have to this point in better understanding how to ensure 
that adults with developmental disabilities have a more uh, fulfilling life. So that's something that I would love to turn the fire under so that we can have more people. Um, my little um, personal uh, story is that that's how I trained in autism. I live in a residential unit for adults and uh, for several years. And the notion there is that all of a sudden we realize that every one of them is an individual with likes and dislikes and personalities. And that uh, each one of them has a huge place in this world. They are uniquely human, but we need to make a much better effort to both understanding them as well as to promoting that inclusion. Thank you, Ami, that's great. I wanna have a chance before we have to end, unfortunately the time is passing very quickly to just check in for final thoughts. Dan, parting words. This has been uh, really great. We've covered a lot of material. I want to just highlight, you know, this. I think we have to um, communicate that there's a balance between, you know, taking care of families and kids who have very severe forms of autism. That we're dedicated to kind of changing that, as well as the notion that there that there's a very large spectrum and that it's definitely not a one size fits all. And uh, we have to begin to, you know, and keep reminding ourselves and our trainees and our our communities that um, just about this notion of uh, individual differences and and uh, to really uh, celebrate that and to uh, that goes everywhere from treatment uh, to just uh, people you run into on the street and just being a little bit more open to those differences, I, uh, especially as a I'm not trained as a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so I'm not nearly as sensitive as Ami and John. So I have to continually remind myself of that. Anyway, it's really been a privilege to be on here uh, with all of you, really, honestly. Thank here, you. Hearing, yeah. John? It really has been a privilege. You know, the three of us have such high regard for your university. We've entrusted, each of us has entrusted our own children or they entrusted themselves to the university. And we're very, uh, uh, all three of us, and, and I, Dan, Ami, and I, and uh, uh, you know, very glad to have had this opportunity to address the group and to have this, you know, opportunity to discuss these issues. I think, you know, this life course approach and the, you know, the the, the importance of recognizing one of the things that was brought up in the chat also of the representation of individuals with autism in all of our stakeholder and communication around, um, you know, our, our highest priorities. Today was kind of predicated as a science kind of based uh, approach to this, but I think um, uh, all of our approaches have to be informed by the full uh, spectrum of all, uh, all people uh, for whom uh, autism and all of its and all of its forms uh, are um, are part of our humanity and our population. Thank you. Lisa? Um, I think I would like to piggyback on what John was just saying. And I know that that's something that we try to focus on here at T-Card and focus on the, the humanity of the individual and of the family. And that has been my goal ever since the beginning of T-Card. Um, I've always thought of us as being very much, you know, the centered on the individual, but also focusing on the needs of the entire family unit um, and understanding that every, every individual that comes through the clinic and that contacts us is going to have unique needs and, and strengths that, you know, we can draw upon in order to best help them. Um, and I know in my work that I do with the Autism Society of Greater New Orleans, you know, the focus has really shifted this year from Autism Awareness Month during April to Autism Acceptance Month um, and really focusing on the fact that they're, you know, it's no longer about, you know, getting the word out about autism. It's helping people to understand exactly what that means and opening up more opportunities for us as a society to accommodate and adapt to this unique differences that we see in individuals who have a diagnosis of autism. So thank you. That's Thanks, always Laura. going to be my goal. Laura. 
You know, I think that, um, first of all, thank you so much for um, organizing this. And it was really a great pleasure to participate in this panel. I guess I just want to leave with a closing concern of mine as I read um, one of the comments of um, a question from a, a gentleman that was joining us um, this evening, um, who has a son with severe aggressive behaviors that is very, very difficult to manage at home. And I think that's a part of the population that we really need to focus on because that part of the population where the child is so severely aggressive um, and has such you know, intense behavioral issues that um, the burden on the family, it's difficult. It's very, very challenging. And it's very, very expensive to care for these um, individuals. And how do we care for them and give them you know, a, you know, a, a life that's, you know, as, as fulfilling as we would give others on the spectrum. So just this whole, the idea of having a spectrum for autism, I wonder how great it is to sort of lump everyone onto a spectrum and not to really identify these different classes of individuals that are affected, these autistic individuals and the severity to which they're affected. Thank you so much. So I think it's clear to the audience who've tuned into this webinar why we're so excited to have all of you as part of the extended Tulane family. And uh, hopefully this uh, relationship will continue for many, many years. I wanna send out a special thanks to the Tulane events crew, Carolyn Keyes, Denise Bro, and Sally Drape, who herded us cats together and organized this and supported us. And we really appreciate that. And I want to especially thank the audience for tuning in. Um, hope you will look forward to additional Tulane events in the future, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be part of the family. <laughs> here, here. Seriously.